The American Parasite No one thought it could happen in North America. A parasite that uses your body as its personal feeding ground, taking over first your stomach, then your entire GI tract, forcing you to crave the foods it wants, while slowly destroying your body from the inside out. Governments are finally admitting that this is real. Measures have been proposed in New York and the country of Mexico to try and stop it. But by the time you watch this, it may already be too late. My name is Craig Capetta. I'm the Director of Science and Nutrition at Whole Body Research International and have spent the last 24 months working with my team of doctors and scientists to figure out a way to stop this parasite that is already estimated to be infecting 250 million Americans. Perhaps the scariest thing is that its symptoms come on slowly. You may never even realize your fatigue, weight gain, or lack of sleep is the result of this bad bug until it finally takes over and forces you to seek medical attention. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you a simple test you can do to find out whether or not you've been infected, and if so, how to get rid of it before it causes potentially irreversible damage. I'm also going to expose the major government screw-up that allowed this to happen, and how they are now scrambling to fix it. Warning, the information I'm about to share with you is controversial, because this parasite comes from the most unlikely place, your food supply. In the next few minutes, I'm going to expose the manipulative practices of several very large corporations, companies like General Mills, Nestle, and Coca-Cola, that they prayed the public would never discover. It's a tangled web of bribery that makes your average politician look like a saint, and they are currently spending tens of millions of dollars in false advertising to try to cover up what they have done. But it's about time someone pulled back the curtain. That's why I've spent a considerable amount of time and my own money over the last few months creating this video that they do not want you to see. So if you're serious about the health of your family, turn off your cell phone, take a seat, and make sure you watch every word of this presentation. What you are about to see and hear may shock you, but it may also save your life. Let's get started. The year was 1950. The death rate by heart disease in America had jumped to an astonishing 30%. Only far back as the 1900s, it was 10%. In just 50 years, deadly heart attacks had increased by a factor of three times. People were dropping dead at an alarming rate, and no one could figure out why. Then, on September 24, 1955, America's own president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, suffered a heart attack, sending the entire nation into a panic. The crisis was now real. On Monday, September 26th, the Dow Jones plunged 6.5%. The total paper loss of the day was $14 billion, the largest ever, including that of the Great Depression. President Eisenhower would not walk again until October 25th and would not return to the White House until November 11th, nearly six weeks later. By this time, the fear of heart attacks was on everyone's mind. Enter government researcher Ansel Keys. Mr. Keyes was a Harvard-educated scientist who had helped design rations for the U.S. Army during World War II. Mr. Keyes set out to discover why Americans had the highest rate of heart attacks out of any of the First World countries. In what would later become known as the Seven Country Study, Mr. Keyes discovered that Mediterranean nations had the lowest heart attack rates in the world. Their diet also contained the lowest amount of fat. He concluded the American high-fat diet was to blame for our heart attack problem. Correct or not, finally, the public had an answer. In 1956, representatives of the American Heart Association appeared on television to inform the public that a diet which included fats, such as butter and lard, and fatty foods, such as eggs and beef, would directly lead to deadly coronary heart disease. The government's own health officials began recommending people adopt a low-fat diet to protect themselves and their families. Brochures on how to eat low-fat were passed out in schools. No one wanted to suffer the same fate as the president, or worse, drop dead. Most were fine with Mr. Key's reasoning. He became a celebrated hero and was even put on the cover of Time magazine, though he himself would many years later change his own opinion on the matter. For the time, a low-fat diet was universally accepted as the only surefire heart attack fix. Yet there was one sector that wasn't happy with this, and that was the big food conglomerates. You see, previous to Key's findings, their favorite way to flavor their foods was by adding more fat. Food scientists had discovered that fat was a flavor carrier. It could deliver taste and odor compounds from different parts of food and provided texture and mouthfeel that made food taste better. Without fat, food tasted like cardboard. 
but now the public was demanding their foods be low-fat. Processed and canned foods began to go uneaten as people turned to more natural, lower-fat alternatives. If it didn't say low-fat on the label, people stopped buying it. The conglomerates scrambled to find new recipes that would allow them to call their products low-fat, yet still taste good. Food scientists were called in by the dozens, and finally they discovered something even better. You see, unlike fat, this new flavor additive was actually addicting. It goes by many different names, but you may know it best as refined sugar. Did the food industry know it was dangerous? Even many doctors of the 1950s would argue they certainly did. As far back as 1808, studies had been done proving sugar was not only unhealthy, but actually toxic. Believe it or not, sugar manufacturers were pulling PR stunts back then, as they do today. In 1808, the Committee of West India, a large sugar conglomerate of the time, appeared before the British House of Commons to offer a prize of 25 guineas, about $1,000 in today's coin, to anyone who could show an experiment that proved sugar was good for feeding and fattening cows, hogs, and sheep. Food for animals has always been expensive. Sugar was extremely cheap, so many farmers took on the challenge, hoping for good results. The 25 guineas would be just a bonus to the new, cheaper food supply. But as you may have guessed, the attempts were a disaster. Many resulted in the death of livestock. One member of Parliament, John Kerwin, took on the challenge himself, trying to feed sugar and molasses to his calves. After the experiment of this well-known, highly-ranked politician failed, the Committee of West India gave up. Then, in 1816, the well-known French physiologist F. Majandi did an experiment of his own involving dogs. He determined that dogs fed with water containing sugar and olive oil wasted away and died faster than dogs fed with water alone. This showed sugar not only had no nutritional value, but actually caused negative effects. This shut the sugar manufacturers up, but just for the time being. Flashback to 1957. Fat was out. The food industry had found foods packaged with sugar were winning every taste test. But would the public buy it? As recently as the 1930s, Dr. Weston A. Price, a research dentist from Ohio, had traveled around the world observing different cultures and their diets. In 1939, he published a paper that revealed in horrifying detail what had happened to the teeth and health of those in cultures who had incorporated refined sugars into their food supply. Sugar still had a bad name the conglomerates would need to make a move. Later, in 1957, noted Professor E. V. McCollum, who was often referred to as America's top nutritionist of the day, published a book called A History of Nutrition. In it, he argued that despite there being dozens of experiments done since the 1800s, proving sugar was bad for human consumption, those experiments were all flawed due to human error. This book was published and marketed with the same ferocity you see with bestsellers today. But where did it come from? No scientist has his own money to publish a book on such a grand scale. And let's face it, a history of nutrition? It's not a title that will make a book fly off the shelves. A look inside the book revealed it was published and marketed by a company called the Nutrition Foundation, Incorporated. Who was the Nutrition Foundation? I'm glad you asked. It happened to be a front organization for the leading sugar conglomerates of the time, including the American Sugar Refining Company, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Curtis Candy Company, General Foods, General Mills, Nestle, Pet Milk Company, and Sunshine Biscuits, about 45 companies in all. And did the Americans buy it? Oh boy, did they ever. Sales of processed foods skyrocketed. All they had to do was put low fat on the label, then dump in a bunch of refined sugar, and it would sell like crazy. A 2012 study by Dr. Robert Lustig of the University of California, San Francisco, revealed that sugar is just as addictive to the human brain as cocaine, setting off the same dopamine triggers and forcing us to crave more and more of it. So it was only natural that humans would begin to consume the new sugared products at a feverish rate. The food conglomerates responded to the increasing sales by using even more sugar. It began to find its way into foods you would never expect, like hot dogs, yogurt, spaghetti, and breads. As the decades passed, obstacles would spring up, but each time, the conglomerates had an answer. In 1965, the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act began, requiring their products to be honestly and informatively labeled. By this time, the public wasn't so hot on sugar anymore, but that made no difference. The conglomerate